Welcome. Today, religious terrorism is not a strange concept. Notable examples in recent times include the 9-11 terrorist attack in the United States, as well as later attacks in places such as Britain, the Netherlands, and France. But if you spoke about religious terrorism to someone who lived in 16th or 17th century Europe, they probably would have looked at you a little funny, because the word terrorism did not yet exist. Today, we'll look at how recent historical scholarship has used the concept of terrorism to help explain various episodes of early modern religious violence. So, what is terrorism? Very briefly, the words terrorism and terrorist came into existence during the French Revolution. They were used to denote illegal acts of political violence by the revolutionary government. Since then, the definition of terrorism has become more strict. In modern political thought, there is a crucial distinction between war and terror. That distinction hinges on the question of legitimate political authority. War is political violence by a state. Terrorism is also political violence, but without state sanction. So, states declare war, but non-state entities, such as revolutionaries, commit acts of terror. Revolutionaries often justify themselves by appealing to some higher authority, such as God or the will of the people. But, what they cannot and do not use for self-justification is an appeal to the reigning political authority, which is often the very political authority that they oppose. After the terrorist attacks on the United States on September 11, 2001, references to terrorism began appearing by the handful in historical scholarship, including scholarship on 16th and 17th century Europe. One early example comes from 2005, in Lisa Jardine's fascinating little book, The Awful End of Prince William the Silent. Note its subtitle, The First Assassination of a Head of State with a Handgun. In the book's introduction, Jardine compares the assassin to modern-day suicide bombers, then as now, and all too like the suicide bombers of the 21st century. Intense commitment to his faith gave the assassin the determination to commit an atrocity in circumstances which made it unlikely that he himself would survive the attempt. More references to suicide bombers appear later in the book, too. And in this, Jardine is not unique in revealing the influence of early 21st century religious terrorism on scholarship. Let's look at another example. In his book on the gunpowder plot of 1605, James Sharp studies how militant Catholics sought to blow up England's Parliament and, thereby, restore Catholicism, which was outlawed with the accession of Elizabeth I in 1559. Sharp compares the gunpowder plot with the 9-11 terror attack. Who, in the early 21st century, could fail to be reminded of the 11th of September, 2001, of that unforgettable image of the airliners slicing the Twin Towers, of their collapse, of the dead and the injured, and of the dust-covered survivors walking through the rubble. But there is some truth here. If the gunpowder plot had succeeded in 1605, its outcome would have been quite similar to the horrific realities of New York City on the fateful day of September 11th. Although there are differences, in both terminology and political theory, we sometimes find similarities in human behavior when we compare diverse eras and even diverse populations. The 20th century saw multiple instances in which a revolutionary group successfully overthrew an allegedly authoritarian government, only to then become even more oppressive. The Russian and Cuban revolutions are prime examples here, but something similar happened in Scotland in 1560. Reformed Protestants were the most militant Protestants, and 
In Scotland, they first abolished Catholicism and then led the country into civil war. Their monarch, Mary, Queen of Scots, eventually fled the country, and Scotland became a Reformed Protestant kingdom. In recent scholarship on the Scottish Reformation, we also find talk of terrorism. A good example is Alec Ryrie's book, The Origins of the Scottish Reformation. In it, he describes the Scottish Reformation as arguably the first modern revolution. But he also describes the more violent acts of the Scottish Reformation in the terms that we've been discussing here. For example, Scottish Protestants sometimes burned Catholic churches, and Ryrie describes this as a genuine act of religious terrorism. Now, this is a fairly benign use of the word terrorism. He draws no points of comparison between the events of 16th century Scotland and those that occurred in the early 21st century. But the terms of description, revolution, and terrorism, nonetheless deserve further consideration. When we study past eras, if we perceive something like terrorism or revolution, we want to ask a key historical question. What did contemporaries call it? That is, how did those living at the time describe these unprecedented acts of violence? Consider the following, which comes from the pen of John Knox, one of the first Scottish Protestants and author of the first history of the Scottish Reformation. Protesting the practice of Catholicism, the Scottish Protestants wrote, What godly man can be offended that we shall seek reformation of these enormities? Yea, even by force of arms, seeing that other ways it is denied unto us. And this gave rise to a key phrase, reformation by force of arms. For the next century, throughout the British Isles, this great catchphrase, reformation by force of arms, was used by religious militants usually Protestants, but sometimes Catholic. So, while we might describe such threats and acts as terrorism, they described it as reformation by force of arms. But as I said earlier, there are also similarities in behavior across different historical eras. For example, modern-day religious terrorists often describe their conflict in apocalyptic terms, claiming that their opponents are in league with the devil. Scottish Protestants did the exact same, describing their enemies with such phrases as the generation of Antichrist. Thereby, they also alleged that their opponents were in league with the devil. So again, there are similarities in behavior, but there are differences in the concepts and terminology used. Importantly, then as now, no one religious or political group had a monopoly on violence, and sometimes violent acts were committed by citizens of one country working in collusion with another state. This certainly complicates the clear-cut distinction between terrorism and war. Such was the case with the 1584 assassination of William I of Orange, better known as Prince William the Silent. He was king of the Netherlands, which was then engaged and a war for independence from the Spanish crown. Consequently, the King of Spain, Philip II, publicly offered an award to anyone who killed the Prince of Orange. So, we immediately have a problem. Philip II's promised award occurred within the context of war. So, was it an act of terror, or was it an act of war? Here, the neat theoretical distinction between terrorism and war is less clear-cut. But this assassination is notable for another reason. It was the first time in history that a handgun was used to assassinate a head of state. At the time, the handgun was new technology, and putting it to such deadly use sent shockwaves throughout Christian Europe. Part of what made it such an effective weapon for assassination was that unlike earlier guns, it could be primed before use. In other words, all you had to do was point and pull the trigger. And that is exactly what happened. In 1584, the Prince of Orange was assassinated by Balthazar Girard, a Catholic employed by the Spanish government. So, I'll ask again, was this terrorism? Or was it an act of war? And thus, 
one of many violent acts and a longer revolutionary struggle between the Netherlands and Spain. Of course, sometimes militancy backfires, and so it was with the failed gunpowder plot of 1605. Here, too, we must turn to the 16th century for the larger story. In 1570, Pope Pius V excommunicated England's queen, Elizabeth I, who sought to combine Catholic and Protestant populations together in the English church. From the Pope's perspective, this was heresy. And at several points during Elizabeth's reign, there were attempts at overthrowing the queen and reinstating Catholicism by force. The most well-known such instance was the Spanish Armada's failed invasion in 1588. But after the Queen's death in 1603, militant Catholics continued to plot the restoration of their religion. And on November 5, 1605, a militant Catholic named Guy Fox attempted to blow up the entire English Parliament, thereby obliterating England's entire government, including the monarch. Fox believed that this would help restore Catholicism within England. By way of comparison, if this had been successful, it would have caused far more chaos than 9-11 succeeded in causing here in the United States. But Fox was caught, tried, convicted, and executed. A day of public religious thanksgiving for his arrest was declared, and the 5th of November remained a day of national prayer for the next 200 years. It's probably no exaggeration to say that every culture finds ways of neutralizing past violence. One way to do so is through commemoration. In England, remembering the 5th of November has largely lost its religious grounding. Today, it's a popular holiday, complete with bonfires, fireworks, and parties. But cultural memory takes myriad forms. For example, the 5th of November gave rise to a popular children's rhyme. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. But at another level, the 5th of November has also found more adult expressions. Most recent and popular here is the graphic novel V for Vendetta, which was published in the 1980s. Here, the memory of Guy Fox becomes an inspiration for anarchist resistance to fascism, which is polemically conflated with the British government of the time. But whatever you make of its politics, the story itself is engaging, and it inspired a film adaptation in 2005. Elements of the original remained firmly in place, but details were also changed in order to make the film attack not only totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, but also the American government following its invasion of Iraq in 2003. Both the comic and the film portray terrorist acts as political tools used to regain a more ideal past. In this, perhaps they are not far removed from their source material in the historical Guy Fox. So what? Now I'm going to play Devil's Advocate. Earlier, I noted that terrorism is a concept that came out of the French Revolution. And today, terrorism is understood as a particular form of violence, one fundamentally distinct from war, which is a form of violence unique to the state. But no one in the 16th or 17th centuries operated with this kind of distinction in mind. So, even if we find similarities between how people behaved then and now, there is also a massive conceptual gap between their era and our own. There's an inherent risk in using modern concepts to describe a past world where such concepts did not exist. The technical term is anachronism. And anachronism risks ramifications. By making comparisons, we invite further comparisons. For example, today, in our own context, a phrase like religious terrorist immediately brings to mind someone like Osama bin Laden. So, if we also call someone like John Knox or Guy Fox a religious terrorist, are we thereby inviting others to think of them as the bin Ladens of their day? And, if we do this, 
are we transferring our own negative emotions against one group of religious extremists today to another group in the much deeper past? If the terms terrorist and terrorism are appealing primarily at an emotional level, then the intellectual justification for using these terms is probably quite weak, and the weight of historical argument is ultimately intellectual, not emotional. So although it may be helpful to use modern ideas about terrorism to interpret older historical periods, there is also a risk, and we need to really grapple with whether it's a risk worth taking. If you're interested in learning more, these books are worth consulting. First are three books that I discussed earlier. One is Alec Ryrie's The Origins of the Scottish Reformation. It covers one of the more explosive Protestant movements of the mid-16th century, and how its apocalyptic vision and violent acts fundamentally transformed Scotland. Another is Lisa Jardine's The Awful End of Prince William the Silent, the first assassination of a head of state with a handgun. Combining politics, religion, and military technology, Jardine covers one of the most important and destructive political developments of the last 500 years. Finally, is James Sharp's study, Remember, Remember, a cultural history of Guy Fawkes Day. Beginning with the history of November 5th, Sharp traces how later generations remembered and reinvented one of the most shocking political acts of the period. Last but not least, for a programmatic overview of terrorism as a concept, together with illustrations from the 16th and 17th centuries, read Robert Applebaum's book, Terrorism Before the Letter, Mythography and Political Violence in England, Scotland, and France, 1559 to 1642. It's the most comprehensive analysis of how terrorism can be used to interpret early modern religious and political conflict. That's all for now. Thanks so much for watching. Please hit the subscribe button, feel free to leave a comment, and I'll see you next time.